Welcome to the film analysis today with the Toy Story film franchise. When merchandise starts dancing, talking and singing and the song states you've got a friend in me, the film's cuteness should be understood as a sales strategy, not only promoting the film. Rather, the Toy Story films advertise in three ways. First, they advertise themselves by using said song and 1000 great ideas, eventually persuading the audience to watch a film about products. Secondly, the films advertise individual products such as Mattel's Barbie by animating these lifeless objects. Animation films are obsessed with the idea of animism. Thirdly, the film advertises consumption and its promises. Toy Story is nothing short of an advertisement for capitalism, nicely packaging its essence like a commodity. Now and then we may tear open the wrapping paper. Of course, the film suggests another reading, friendship in different forms. One is about the friendships of people with toys, that is goods. One is about the friendship of Andy and later Bonnie or to the toys. The toys befriend each other as well. Talking, cleaning products and dancing mascots have existed ever since advertising has existed. But in 1995 with Toy Story, advertising became a film's entire principle, a first. What are all the films about? A child owns toys, in more general terms, merchandise. These goods come to life when the child is absent. In each Toy Story entry, the toys worry about not being loved enough by the child. These living goods mirror the child's view of toys. A child plays with the doll as if it were alive, as the first Toy Story illustrates. In it, two toys compete. The astronaut figure Buzz threatens to replace the cowboy figure Woody. As in film history, sci-fi replaces the western. At the same time, the astronaut represents a space cowboy. What happens here? It's not that simple. To begin with, the goods in the children's room are removed from the sphere of exchange. Adults have bought this toy for a child. Regarding commodities, one must first distinguish between use value and exchange value. Exchange value signals what the respective commodity is exchanged for. Today money represents an abstract exchange value, say the toy amounts to a hundred dollars. In pre-capitalist time one could also imagine exchange values working differently with goods being exchanged directly for each other. I hand over a Nintendo and receive a PlayStation in return. Then there is the use value. What am I using the commodity for? This question is only asked by the buyer, not the seller. In Toy Story, for example, Andy's parents or Andy himself wants a toy. He wants to play with it and brag about it. Use value does not only refer to usefulness, as the Rolex example demonstrates. A Rolex shows the time. It has another use value. It also signals social and economic status. Nobody would buy a Rolex only for the reason to tell the time. Let's apply status to toys. Children not only play with toys but must own them to be considered cool in the schoolyard. That too is a use value. In his fantastic book Critique of Commodity Aesthetics, the Marxist philosopher Wolfgang Fritz Haug has described how exchange value and use value are related. He writes, 
from the point of view of exchange value, all that matters up to the end, namely the conclusion of the contract of sale, is the promise of use value of one's commodity. Here, from the outset, there is a strong accent because it is economically functional on the appearance of the use value, which, considered in the individual act of purchase, tends to play a role as mere appearance. The aesthetic of the commodity in the broadest sense, the central appearance and meaning of its use value, is detached from the object. Appearance becomes as important and in fact more important for the execution of the act of purchase as being. What is only something but does not look like being is not bought. What appears to be something is probably bought." End of quote. The value proposition plays the decisive role. This includes Andy finding a friend in the cowboy figure Woody, in line with the advertising strategy enticing the viewer to buy. The Toy Story series shows the day after the purchase. Although the promise of use has been fulfilled for a while, Woody was Andy's best friend, but now comes the replacement in the form of astronaut Buzz. For Andy, Buzz seems to have a higher use value than Woody, due to his many functions and on top of that, he is new. Now both goods compete for the customer, a typical nursery situation. An impressive display of toys enters the children's room, a Nintendo or PlayStation, Lego or Playmobil, just to name a few. Therefore, they all strive for a monopoly reminiscent of Barbie. The Films come up with a remarkable idea. The commodities have left the sphere of exchange because they have already been bought. Now the sale continues. The children's room turns into a shopping mall. There the goods buy for the favor of the buyer or the child. They Entice with their appearance, they preen themselves, they do everything the child could possibly want. Andy is to be persuaded to buy again, even if money plays no role in the matter. It is not only Andy, but first and foremost the viewer who is persuaded to buy. In fact, Woody and many other characters in the film can be bought. The narrative emo no, uh, emotionalizes, viewers grow fond of the characters in the film and therefore buy them. In the first Toy Story, Woody and Buzz compete. Eventually, they both achieve their raison d'etre. One is supposed to buy both. In the second part, however, the figures are threatened with the flea market, the second exploitation, so to speak, no longer making much money. It represents only the reflection of the original exchange relationship. The goods therefore do not desire the flea market very much. Woody is afraid of becoming rubbish. He even has a nightmare. The film repeats this very fear. In truth, capitalism thrives on it. It constantly requires new insensitives to buy so that new goods can be produced and bought again. Things that promise high, value, uh, high use value but have little or short use value are ideal, like toys. Children want something, play with it for a few days, then it lies in the corner and they need something new again. That's why we don't have much left over from our own childhood, maybe a box with a few really important toys for one, but you are not attached to the junk anymore.
We have experienced this in the adult world as well, accelerated by planned obsolescence. Goods don't last long enough for us to buy them again. Another option for goods, if they do not become rubbish, they may acquire a collector's value. They can become sought after objects, even speculative objects. Exactly what's happening in the second part. A strange collector grabs Woody who is to be discarded for the flea market. He takes Woody into his collection. He wants to sell these for a profit. At the same time, there is also a scene in a toy shop where the main characters see the other characters themselves mirrored several times. A beautiful contradiction. Every good promises uniqueness although capitalism produces them in series. The film comments smugly on this, stating short-sighted traders had once bought too few bus figures and thus could not meet the demand. Toy Story repeatedly exposes the capitalist contradictions only to close over them immediately afterwards. For example, with a love song as sung by the cowgirl in the second part, when she loved me, extremely sentimental. Wolfgang Fritz Haug, writing about the logic of the goods in the department stores, applies. Quote, These things are not ordinary, no ordinary lamps, shoes, umbrellas, hats, curtains, but representatives of an imagined Happiness. They offer themselves for sale as lamps and cushions of happiness, even threads and buttons of happiness. We would say in Toy Story as goods of friendship. Continue. They are built into strained notions of happiness. Their substance pushes at their surface. Their exterior is absorbed in being an express expression of this happiness. Thus, in the department stores, everything throws itself outwards." End of quote. This very department store situation is found again and again in the Toy Story films. They enact what Karl Marx called commodity fetishism. In Toy Story, it happens quite in the Marxist sense, but also not. Andy attaches a certain and thus also changeable value to the toys. In return, the value lies not in the commodities as a substance, but people attribute the value. This is very much in line with Marx. At the same time, the personified toys achieve exactly the opposite effect. They pretend to have value as commodities in themselves. Karl Marx writes something interesting about the relation of the commodity fetishism. Every commodity consists of human labor. But once the commodities reach the sphere of exchange, many seem to ignore the labor time in the and of the commodities. The processes of production seem invincible, Marx writes. This, according to him, aligns with religion. Quote, in order, therefore, to find an analogy, we must take flight into the misty realm of religion. There, the products of the human brain appear as autonomous figures endowed with a life of their own, which enter into relations both with each other and with the human race. So it is in the world of commodities with the products of man's hands. I call this the fetishism which attaches itself to the products of labor as soon as they are produced as commodities and is therefore inseparable from the production of commodities." End of quote. Let us Think of the Greek world of gods, that is, human ideas. But these gods 
are free for themselves as if they didn't relate to the human ideas that produced them in the first place applying to commodities and their production process as well. Toy Story does not consider the work involved in the production of the goods. The fourth Toy Story part does not deviate from this but adds two new aspects the shop-worn goods and the rubbish. During the Odyssey in the fourth part, Woody comes across a doll in an antique shop that nobody wants. The film is now also about this doll being sold to women. The modern economy is afraid of shopkeepers. What now? The warehouses are getting smaller and smaller. That's where the debt capital is stored. Goods that no one wants are shredded or end up in the rubbish. All the Toy Story films show this. If the value proposition no longer holds, that is, if the marketing campaign doesn't work or the value of the product evaporates, then goods are rendered rubbish. The Toy Story films tell this symbolically with a coming-of-age story. The child is too old for the toys and when we look at the goods in the department stores with childlike eyes, we are adults at some point and realize, did I really need that? The aspect of waste matters too. Goods stem from waste. The girl Bonnie makes a little figure out of an old discarded spoon, a few other details and calls it Forky, a recycling process. See stonewashed jeans or shabby chic and furniture, things seem old on purpose. Rubbish becomes commodity again. It enters the sphere of exchange once more. That's what part four is about. With Forky, Toy Story at least once shows Bonnie producing the product a rare moment. But at the same time, we forget it as soon as Forky comes to life, transforming himself, as Marx would say, into a super metaphysical thing. The film sells a critique of consumption that is not a critique. It supports consumption precisely because the film insists on the value of commodities, wants us to throw them away carelessly and ask us to become attached to them. Above all, Toy Story helps ownership remain as it is. Apart from the third part, Andy brings toys to the kindergarten. There, the bear explains here, in Sunside, in Sunnyside, we don't need owners. All the toys are free. We oversee our own happiness. The beer describes a socialization without property or ownership, even a classless society. However, one per person does rule the bear who turns out to be the villain in the film. He represents a somewhat socialist dictator. Is Hollywood fighting socialism again? No and yes. No, because in the end most of the toys, including Barbie, stay in almost communist Sunnyside, as the credits also illustrate. Yes, because the important main characters only change hands. Bonnie takes over Andy's toys, but both in the film and in reality, only the goods seem to be free, while the appearance of the goods causes us only to watch, but not to see. It would be nice if you would like to support the film analysis financially. You can do so via my bank account or PayPal. Also, you can find me on Patreon. Thank you very much.